Okay. Um, so um, uh, welcome back and uh, welcome all of you uh, to the evolution and biodiversity session um, of this uh, conference. I'm um, uh, Frederick Ronquist. Uh, I'm professor uh, at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in Stockholm. And I'm the research area lead uh, for, the, for evolution and biodiversity within uh, the DDLS uh, program. Uh, so this session uh, will bring, uh, bring you three different perspectives on data-driven uh, research in evolution and biodiversity. Uh, um, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome as our uh, first uh, speaker, Tobias Andermann. Uh, and um, uh, Tobias is uh, one in the first group of uh, three DDLS fellows in evolution and biodiversity. Uh, he will be placed at Uppsala University. He defended his uh, PhD at the University of Gothenburg only a year ago. Uh, in his uh, research, uh, Tobias is um, uh, taking on big uh, biodiversity data and using Bayesian inference and machine learning um, techniques uh, to generate uh, novel insights. And I very much look forward to hearing what, uh, where Tobias is coming from, where he plans to go with uh, his group uh, within the DDLS uh, program. So please, uh, Tobias, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Frederick. And um, let me just get my screen shared here. Okay, so yeah, today I want to talk a bit about um, my past research in the field of biodiversity research and uh, and also a little bit, as Frederick already hinted, like the future direction where this research can be taken. And uh, you see in the background already um, a nice figure of just um, a, the data type that is being frequently used now in, in um, general landscape modeling and biodiversity modeling, which is in this case a 3D laser point cloud. Uh, it can be used to model the features of the landscape such as biomass and uh, vegetation cover. But more about that later, I first wanna um, draw your attention a little bit to, to this framework of planetary boundaries. So you may have seen this before, this was published by Rockstrom et al in 2009, and it describes nine different categories how humans are affecting the planetary balance in, in different ways. You see, for example, the very familiar climate crisis here on the top uh, and the severity of how much we overstep these boundaries uh, shown in red. And you see biodiversity loss really sticking out as the most severely overstepped boundary. So this means that while climate change, uh, which is a very severely overstepped boundary as well, is still within a range that is potentially, that can potentially be returned to sustainable levels, biodiversity loss is far beyond that. So we have no hopes of ever returning to a pre-anthropogenic um, level with uh, our effect on biodiversity. Um, However, there's still a lot that can, that can be done in this regard and a lot of reason to care about biodiversity. So it's not surprising that we have such a strong biodiversity footprint uh, given the, the different ranges, the different ways of how we're affecting the planet. Here are just some images of the most common or the most um, pressing human impacts on biodiversity, such as large scale mining, deforestation, uh, pollution, and also general human overpopulation. And you may have seen statistics like the one published by the Living Planet Index, um, which observed tens of thousands of animal populations over very long-term studies. And they came to the conclusion that population size of mammals, fish, and amphibians and reptiles together uh, have seen an, a drop of almost 70% over the last 50 years. So this means that while many of the species still exist, we actually have uh, recorded a dramatic population uh, drop in, in most of these species. So these are very severe uh, indicators of the state of biodiversity and it's a very rapid decline. However, um, looking at these global um, averages is certainly helpful in evaluating our overall human impact, but uh, we also need more comprehensive biodiversity metrics to, to really work with on, on a more like local level, on a more governmental level. So we need ways of, for example, the Swedish government uh, to be able to tell whether a certain biodiversity protection measure has actually shown an effect over a certain time period or not. So we need, we need tools that can quantify biodiversity, that can quantify the health of biodiversity and as well as other aspects of it. And there are some existing approaches. This is a field of research that a lot of people are thinking about and uh, putting resources into about uh, in generally uh, the field of biodiversity indicators. 
And many of these approaches rely on publicly available data, such as species diversity data, uh, extinction risks. For example, if we know for an area uh, to, to have an unusually high concentration of species or an, a high po a percentage of very endangered species, those are obviously things we want to take into account when determining the health and the biodiversity uh, metric of this uh, system. However, there is a big problem here that uh, these databases that exist and the data within, they have very severe, a very large geographic and as well as taxonomic biases. So often the groups that we have the best data for are always the same, uh, usually consisting of vertebrates, some plant groups, but there is most of the tree of life that we actually know hardly anything about. So these, these biases, uh, both geographically and taxonomically are a big challenge in this field of research. And uh, here in this uh, talk, I want to talk a little bit about uh, tools that uh, I have developed and been part of the development of that can to some extent um, account for these biases that can actually um, impute data that, that may not exist at this point and also um, be able to, to quantify biodiversity in, in a bit of a different way than uh, how it is classically done. And then I also want to give a bit of an overview of uh, where this research could be taken in the future and the, the type of research that I plan to establish at Uppsala University uh, with this DDLS fellowship program. So first talking about estimation extinction risks, you may have heard of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN Red List. That's basically our biggest database that gives us information about extinction threats. So how do we know if a species is threatened or not? Uh, usually um, the IUCN has this framework that you see on the left uh, where a species is classified by an expert group of, um, of biologists or uh, basically through data collection over sometimes many centuries or many decades. Um, and is then placed in one of these five categories right, reaching from least concern to critically endangered. And you see, for example, on the example of birds, how the current bird diversity, the current bird species diversity is distributed ac across these different categories. Most bird species, about 8,400 of them are considered least concerned. That means uh, least threatened, so not immediately threatened by extinction. But then a good portion of species is considered vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered, all of which are considered um, threatened uh, categories. So this is a uh, very useful data for many applications in biology for many data-driven um, uh, applications where we can basically mine these data from these online databases and, and, and automatically have some measure of extinction threat for a given species. But this relies on uh, data being available and having been made available in this framework. And that is this data um, distribution is much better for some groups than for others. For example, for birds, we have all species that are currently described assessed within this framework. Similarly, for mammals and amphibians, we also have a big percentage of all species assessed. But then for other groups, such as plants, and even more so for um, insects and fungi, we miss the vast majority of all species uh, in this framework. So for most, almost all fungi species, for example, we cannot uh, decide based on these data whether or not we're looking at a threatened species or a non-threatened species. And uh, average uh, globally, only 6% of all known species have an extinction threat status assigned within this framework. However, there's a lot more data out there um, that is not of this nature, but other type of data for uh, the majority of organisms of the majority of species. So about 62% of all species that we know today have actually geographic data available that is stored on GBIF, um, which uh, consists of coordinates basically of their occurrences. And these come from, these can come from different research projects as well as from citizen science projects. So here we have a really big wealth of data uh, on where species occur, where they have been identified in the field. And these coordinates can maybe give us some idea about their threat status. So can we use this geographic information that exists for so many more species to somehow meaningfully model their extinction risk status? That's uh, what was at the base of this project where we developed a neural network uh, algorithm that can uh, look at the geographic records of a given species and automatically compile a range of different summary statistics, such as geographic features, climatic features, biome features, aka where uh, in which biomes of species is recorded, as well as human footprint features. And, and these different uh, types of summary statistics are then used in a neural network approach that uh, is trained on those species that have a valid IUCN extinction risk assessment within this framework. And then once trained can be used to predict the extinction threat status for those species that are not assessed within this framework. This is available as an R package, it's called IUCNN, 
and it can actually help us to fill uh, substantial gaps in the data. Um, for example, for orchids here, uh, there are 5% of the global biodiversity of orchids currently assessed within the uh, red list uh, framework. After applying our, our trained model, we can get this number up to 47%. Uh, so the reason why we don't get 100% is that we still don't have geographic data or enough geographic data for all species to, to apply this model to, but we can make a substantial gain in data and data availability using these, uh, this new network approach. We can do this at about an 81% accuracy uh, to distinguish between threatened and non-threatened species. And you see, this is not by far not perfect, but it def definitely helps us to, to inform us a little better than uh, the existing limited data um, on extinction threat status and, and help us maybe in many downstream applications to, to get proxies of extinction threat for, for a vast majority of species. Here we applied this model to an empirical data set of trees, a sort of the global tree diversity, and can increase the number of assessed species from 52 to 89%, also at about 84% accuracy. And uh, here we summarize these, these results uh, broken down by biome. So you see, for example, um, for a given biome, the actual number of species assessed within this framework in, in dark red that is threatened, and then the actual number of species uh, uh, that is assessed as non-threatened. And then in the lighter colors, you see the additional species that could be filled in by our neural network approach. And uh, so you see how, how imputing data like this or estimating data based on the geographic ranges, we can improve our understanding to identify areas uh, that have an unusual high uh, percentage of extinction uh, or uh, species with high extinction threat and can get a better overview of, of the total distribution of extinction threat. And another potential application of, of these extinction risk data is to use them in, uh, in downstream applications. For example, here, uh, this is a program I developed that can use these IUCN categorical data to, to simulate stochastically species extinction risks. There are ways of translating these uh, categorical data into actual extinction um, threat probabilities that then can be used in stochastic simulation approaches to, to simulate uh, for a given group um, expected extinctions and the timing of these extinctions. And uh, this framework also allows to add species traits such as generation length and uh, also considers the, the history of actual IUCN assessments. So we can really complicate these, uh, we can complement these types of data um, with uh, approaches like the one I just showed and, and get a better representation of the distribution of, uh, of IUCN extinction risk statuses today, and then use this information to model the expected distribution of IUCN statuses in the future. And here you see for mammals, an additional category, which is extinct species that are modeled within this framework in the next 100 years. And additionally, the, this program is also is able to actually identify specific numeric values for each, uh, for each species. This is done in an MCMC algorithm that, that uses repeated stochastic simulations, uh, thousands of them to then estimate uh, the extinction probabilities of individual species given their traits, as well as their IUCN status, as well as the IUCN history of the whole given group. And you can, uh, for example, for the African elephant, we estimate about a 7% extinction probability in this framework within the next 100 years. And for other species like the wolf, uh, the percentage is 1%. So this is just to give you an idea why we actually care about extinction risk data. They, can, they have um, many fold of um, applications in, in downstream app, uh, applications that use these data. And they can actually be used to inform us to, to understand something about the distribution of extinction threat across different biomes, or even maybe on a more localized uh, scale, looking at, at areas that have a high conservation potential because they, they contain a high uh, percentage of possibly or actually identified extinct, uh, high extinction risk species. So moving on to the next part of the talk, uh, talking about the, the spatial distribution of, of species diversity. So you may have seen diversity maps like this, where you actually see that diversity is not distributed evenly in space, but there are areas of high diversity, as here shown for the United States, uh, shown the mammal diversity map, when red you see areas of very high diversity and in blue areas of lower diversity. And how these maps are often generated is using the information we have on individual species and um, generating a, a hypothesis, basically a dis species distribution map where the species is expected to occur, where it could possibly occur. And then adding up these, these maps for all species in a group to get a picture of the overall diversity distribution of a given group like mammals in this case. 
And um, this is all, this is a good approach and uh, it's useful, but it does require us to have species information of basic information for each individual species in this group to get a meaningful uh, estimate of species diversity. So this is, this is possible for mammals, but for many groups such as plants in general, um, we just simply don't have these data on all individual species to, to, to use this approach and to model species distribution maps for all individual species. So for these species groups, we need different approaches. And this is what uh, stood at the beginning of this project where um, um, this is a neural network approach that I developed to extrapolate species diversity from point estimates to larger geographic patterns. And the point estimates we're using here are vegetation plots. And you see one vegetation plot on this figure here. This is basically where a biologist goes in the field, stacks out a certain size square of, let's say, several square meters, and then counts every single plant species that can be found in the square. And this is a very, um, of course, a very um, painstaking process and it's time intensive. But there is a lot of these data that has been collected globally and that's available in the, for example, on the S-plot database that has almost global coverage of such vegetation plots. And here uh, I use these data to train a neural network that can then extrapolate these point estimates of true diversity to, to larger patterns. And the way this is done is we need some training data set such as here for Australia, we have shown in red, all of these points are individual vegetation plots where we have point estimates of true diversity for a defined area. And then we use this data to train a neural network and model things like sampling effort around a certain um, vegetation plot based on publicly available GBIF data, as well as other um, automatically compiled uh, features such as climatic features, human footprint features, soil type features. All of these data are publicly available with a global coverage. And a little more detail of how we actually use these diversity data in this framework is uh, going from one vegetation plot that has a certain number of species and drawing a circle of a given size around this plot. And within the circle, we may or may not find different um, other vegetation plots. And these vegetation plots all contain their own set of species uh, shown here by these different colored symbols. Let's just assume these are species. And when we look at a set of vegetation plots uh, in the vicinity of a given uh, focal pl plot, we can calculate things such as the overall diversity within this, this defined area, as well as uh, measures such as species turnover and um, the alpha diversity, so the point diversity of these different plots. All of these um, biodiversity uh, metrics or scales go into the model as, as training data. And we can actually, or well, very importantly here, we extract the size of this radius, and this can be dynamic. We can use different sizes here, but the size of this metric goes into the model as a feature, a very important feature for the model to learn how to, to, um, to estimate diversity given a certain spatial range. And then this allows us to predict with this model diversity maps and adjust the scale that we want to predict it on. So here we can actually um, adjust the grid size, use it uh, via this, this feature that we have uh, put in the model and dynamically scale diversity estimates to produce overall maps of plant diversity in this case for Australia. We can also, we also have a way of actually uh, quantifying the uncertainty of these estimates to highlight areas that are of lower certainty versus higher certainty. That's not shown here in the slide, but um, we actually found that for the western part of Australia, since our data is all gathered in the eastern part, we uh, we find low uh, um, like low certainty in this in this western part. And but for for in general, this model can actually estimate um, diversity at a, at a fairly accurate range of about 6% average error. That's, that's not too bad. And here, note that here we actually model diversity, uh, not knowing anything about the individual species and where they occur, but actually um, modeling biodiversity as a, as a landscape feature, as, as a feature of, of, the, yeah, of the landscape. So this is really looking at biodiversity more as a, as a property rather than the sum of individual species. And um, so finally, I want to talk a bit about how this, this framework can be taken uh, and expanded in, in future research. So what we just saw, what uh, we did based on this vegetation plot data is, is, is really an exciting tool and is, is nice for, for groups where we can actually go in the field and identify which species we have in a certain defined area. But this is not possible for many groups where actually we don't have even the taxonomic information to identify them properly. So what I'm talking about are things like uh, insects or things like uh, fungi, where uh, here you see a fraction of described species. So this is an estimate of 
how many of the total species that are expected that exist in these groups globally have actually by now been discovered and described. And for plants, we have a pretty good picture um, of the total plant diversity. So about 81% is estimated of all species that may be out there um, of plants. 81% of them we have already described at this point and cataloged. But for fungi, for example, there is a large hidden diversity. So from, we only have 1% of all fungi species that may exist out there. Uh, only 1% is estimated to have been described by now. So for these groups, we cannot send anybody in the field and, and identify these species based on morphological characters. We need different tools to get at this hidden diversity for these groups. And one obvious data type that comes to mind here is environmental DNA. And um, environmental DNA is basically when you extract DNA from an environmental sample, such as uh, taking soil samples from a given site, putting up insect traps and, um, and gathering everything that can be found in there over a certain amount of time, or having air filters that just simply filter DNA fragments that uh, float around in the air over a long time. So there are some, some really good sampling kits for this already out there. And uh, this can be used to get an estimate of the total genetic diversity, the genetic profile of a species community. And uh, the, the real advantage of this tool is it does not necessarily require to know what a given DNA sequence, um, what, what the name of the organism is that it belongs to. So it doesn't require us to have a really uh, perfect reference database, but there are also ways of approximating hidden diversity. There are ways of telling, we have a bunch of different genetic clusters identified here. We don't know their species name, but we know they're genetically different and represent something along the lines of species. So we can make meaningful pro uh, proxies of species diversity using this type of data, including those groups where we don't have taxonomic information. And this can be used in a framework. Let's, let's uh, think about Sweden, the Swedish context, for example, if we have a, a sampling network that is distributed in space that doesn't suffer from geographic biases in the same way as the Australia data did, for example, but is evenly distributed and, and sampled in, intelligently with this framework in mind, uh, we can actually get um, at the DNA data uh, profiles of these um, species communities, creating point estimates of diversity, similarly how we did it for the vegetation plots, but this time based on genetic data, that then also allows us to get species lists for these, for these areas of, of things like fungi, insects, protists, and many other groups that have been, uh, that we don't know much about the diversity patterns at the moment. This can be used just like the plant uh, diversity data to train a neural network using different environmental predictors, and an additional data type that comes in very handy here are remote sensing data, such as the 3D laser scanning point clouds that I showed in the introductory slide, also satellite images. All of these uh, data are publicly available and can actually be used to, to model things like um, vegetation cover and, and uh, uh, layering of forests and uh, general biomass estimations. So we can get a lot of additional features of the landscape here at a very, very high spatial resolution. So this has the potential to really be, become a tool to predict species diversity for all types of groups um, once a, a standardized eDNA protocol can be established both in, in the field work and also in the lab work to amplify markers that can be used to resolve all parts of the tree of life. Not resolving the tree, but identifying the species for the species diversity in these groups. All we need at the end are basically just species lists for a given point in space um, with an estimate with just a number of how many different clusters of species can be found there. And this eventually can be um, combined in, in a very automated pipeline slash database approach where we have eDNA samples coming in. So the sequence data coming into the database automatically being identified um, or identifying unique sequence clusters. Uh, they're called ASVs in, in uh, meta barcoding amplicon sequence variants and then mapping them against reference databases to understand and also genetically mapping them to understand which groups have which diversity and also which species, individual species could actually be identified. This is more or less already in place uh, as the ASV portal on SPDI. So this is, the infrastructure largely exists already to, to um, really foster the, this line of research. And then an additional element can be applying these machine learning tools uh, that they can also then model extinction risk status um, and using first of all available data on extinction risk status for those species that are assessed and using geographic information that is available in public databases, as well as within this database and pipeline um, to model the extinction risk for, for species that have not been assessed yet. To get a more um, representative, overview, representative overview of the extinction risk distribution within a given sample. And this 
can provide uh, weight diversity estimates that can be used for labeling uh, or like quantifying the, the, the diversity in, in a weight manner for a given site, as well as um, adding new training data to, to a, a neural network approach. So we can use this neural network that I showed in the previous slide and have it constantly updated by, by new data that comes into this framework. So this is really the, the, the future vision of my research using, um, using eDNA. So basically using a combination of on-site sampling and also public database access for more data-driven biodiversity assessment that then can, uh, that can allow us to apply much more high resolution species diversity and extinction risk uh, for multidimensional biodiversity metrics. And this largely, uh, or I hope that this will be able to overcome some of these taxonomic biases that currently exist in the publicly available data that's out there. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Tobias, for a stimulating uh, talk. Uh, so it's, yes, let's see, there's a, a question there in the chat. Can you see it, Tobias? Um, just, yep, just getting back to the window here. Yes. Um, conservation biology consider also microorganisms. Uh, mm. Well, why or why not, I guess? <clears throat> yes, uh, definitely, yes. Um, uh, the thing is, yeah, so I mentioned protests, for example, and uh, I mean, I, I'm basically staying here within the uh, eukaryotic realm in general with my approach. Uh, but yeah, this should also be extended to microorganisms. And um, yeah, I've already been talking about that with some researchers at Uppsala University who have also uh, protested uh, that uh, pro uh, protest needs to be on the, on the agenda as well, which I totally agree with. Um, I just uh, decided to focus on terrestrial eukaryote uh, diversity with this pitch. But actually, um, I think there's excellent eDNA data for, for many um, microorganisms out there already from very long-term lake um, um, measurements, for example, like doing eDNA data on, on different lakes in, in a very uh, broad uh, geographic framework across Scandinavia, for example. Um, and also then, of course, there's also marine diversity to bring up a whole other uh, thing um, that also is largely um, not... Uh, or that, that has would profit a lot from from an approach like this, where we actually integrate these eDNA data into into this framework. Yes. So maybe I, I should comment the SPDI that you mentioned, the Swedish Biodiversity Data Infrastructure. So one goal there is, of course, to mobilize the microorganism data, so we can easily combine that with data from other organisms. Mm -hmm. uh, that needs to happen at a much larger scale than we see today. Mm -hmm. uh, do we need to worry about conserving them going extinct? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm probably not in a position to answer that because I don't work with microorganisms, but I'm sure, I mean, there, there are cases of that as well. I mean, where microbes uh, disappear, they maybe are very locally adapted, uh, but um, I'm really not the expert there, but somebody yells yes in the, in the <laughs> script, uh, in the chat. So yeah, I would say yes. As well. <laughs> yeah, I was I, I just one final question for me. There is a lot of interest now in so, so we realize more and more that humans have such a dramatic impact on our, our environment. There's no way we can think about biodiversity going forward without including humans in the picture. So there's a lot of interest in um, you know greening finance, making sure that investments go to activities that have negative, uh, minimum negative impact on biodiversity or even promotes uh, biodiversity. Do you see a role for uh, these techniques and the environmental DNA techniques in, in making mm -hmm. sure that that happens? A lot of this stuff now is based entirely on Earth observation or satellite data. Yep. Yes, absolutely. I think this is one of the probably main applications that I see this framework. Uh, uh, I mean, beyond informing us about biodiversity patterns from a scientific perspective that will be interesting to look at, I actually think this will become a tool for on-site biodiversity assessment to, to measure the current status of a site and, and maybe even over time to, to evaluate how a certain farming practice or, um, or a certain pollution actually affects uh, biodiversity over time. So I think we need these kind of eDNA frameworks that are also standardized in, in the way of sampling to, to observe uh, local impacts on biodiversity and have an on-site sampling uh, technique. I think that is a very important application. Yes, very nice, Brad. I, I think we'll wrap up there. there. There's uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion I'm, I'm sure that we could have, but we will we'll, we'll, um, uh, uh, stop there for now. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, uh, Tobias, yeah. uh, for your stimulating uh, talk. Thank you. I just need to say real quick, I unfortunately can't stick around for, for the discussions afterwards because I'm teaching here, of course, so I have to leave now, but um, yeah, I hope uh, please send me 
uh, questions by email if anybody has any. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, we'll move on to the next talk um, and the next speaker, it's uh, Nicolas Lartillot. Uh, he is at uh, CNRS and placed in Lyon. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that he's one of the rock stars in statistical phylogenetics and phylogenomics. He's certainly uh, been one of the uh, main contributors to advancing uh, the, the frontier in this uh, field for many years. And Nicola has been particularly interested in model-based uh, probabilistic inference and scaling, up, uh, scaling that up so it can be used for genomic scale uh, data sets. So I'm very much looking forward to what you have to tell us, uh, Nicola. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, so let me share first the screen. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah. Okay. So uh, yes, I. So my, my my talk will actually have perhaps two different aspects. Uh, the first aspect is to just uh, introduce uh, some of the current uh, challenges and controversies actually uh, about uh, phylogenomics. So reconstructing the phylogenies based on the genomic data, and some of the solutions uh, on which uh, we have worked uh, over the last. 10 to 15 years to try to solve those issues. But also then, I mean, uh, there is a more general, uh, I have to say, idea or questioning uh, about uh, how to actually do a statistical inference and how to use the modern machine learning method in, in, in that context. So I will try to end on some questions in that respect. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a relatively old uh, uh, like perspective on the phylogeny of animals back from the early 20s uh, to, to uh, 2000s. Uh, because just uh, you see, phylogenetic inference is not actually an easy task. And there has been a lot of uh, hesitation about what is the actual uh, like, uh, phylogeny of animals. And this is an important uh, question if you want to understand the evolution of body plants, for instance. So in that case, you see, uh, the, there have been some hesitations as to the phylogenetic position of some of the groups here, like, like nematodes in particular. So those were originally believed to be like early emerging lineages at the base of uh, coelomates, so deuterostomes and protostomes. And then as data have accumulated, but also as the methods have improved, it's been realized actually that those uh, organisms such as nematodes were not basal were not like early diverging, but were actually sister group to arthropods in that case. And so there have been many uh, controversies like this one, and there are still some running controversies exactly like this. And it all boils down to uh, a, a general problem that it's very difficult to reconstruct phylogenies with uh, confidence, in particular when you have fast evolving uh, groups like nematodes. And this is fundamentally uh, because of an artifact that has been described early on by, uh, by Joseph Rosenstein in, uh, in 78. Basically, you see, when you are in a configuration like this one, that would be the true tree, uh, but you have a very short branch here, like gathering together arthropods and nematodes, then there, there is very little opportunity for having shared derived characters that would actually unite or that would uh, be shared by arthropods and nematodes because this branch here is very short. But actually it's more likely to get just convergent states just by chance between this very long branch here and the very distant outer group. And because of this in the end, so those type of site patterns, nucleotide site patterns will be more frequent in your data matrix as this kind of pattern, which is actually informative about the true phylogeny. And so in the end, you very often reconstruct those phylogenies that are artifactual, like long branch attraction here between nematodes and life. And so that was originally an argument uh, against maximum parsimony, because maximum parsimony will essentially focus on those patterns and will then be statistically inconsistent. And so the argument of Fersenstein was that we should use probabilistic modeling instead. Because fundamentally, if you model the process of evolution, that you will be able to understand that those patterns can occur like frequently by chance and you can correct for this effect. And so basically, the idea of probabilistic models uh, for phylogenies, uh, like simple models have been proposed early on, uh, 
just assuming that all of the nucleotide positions or sites are evolving independently under a continuous time Markov model of uh, substitution that would be essentially parameterized by a, a four by four matrix. So I should say uh, very often in uh, like deep phylogenetics, uh, we often use directly the recorded uh, genetic sequences, uh, like protein coding sequences. And so we directly specify the model of evolution at the level of amino acids. And so in which case we use those kind of uh, empirical uh, matrices, like amino acid replacement matrices. But otherwise, this is the same idea, like we have a Markov model of evolution independent at each site. And then once this model is specified, uh, this defines a certain probability of observing uh, the data given a phylogenetic tree and given the parameters of the model. And then we can use uh, either maximum likelihood or Bayesian inference here uh, by defining a prior over the parameters of the model. So the tree and the model parameters and combining this prior with the likelihood will give us a posterior distribution using base theorem. And then this posterior distribution can be sampled from uh, using just Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. And so essentially uh, trying to update the phylogenetic tree, uh, reassess the posterior probability and accept those moves depending on the ratio between the final and the initial posterior probabilities. Uh, doing this uh, together with uh, uh, updates on the parameters of the model. And by doing this many times, millions of times, we end up uh, with a posterior distribution or a sample from the posterior distribution, uh, which we can then marginalize on the parameter of interest. So typically the phylogeny. So we will just gather, make a consensus tree and just calculate the frequency at which we've seen each of the clades or look at the parameters of interest uh, in terms of like posterior histograms. So that's basically the idea of Bayesian inference. And so more generally probabilistic inference in phylogenies. But then, I mean, those things turn out not to be sufficient. So what I'm showing you here is uh, like uh, a summary of uh, some of the recent controversies, again, concerning the animal phylogeny. So there have been several groups here, in particular, tinophores. Uh, so tinophores, which are like uh, non bilateral uh, metazoans that have a nervous system uh, and so there have been uh, several uh, hypotheses about the position of tinophores, either as a sister group to all other animals or within uh, like sponges being the sister group instead. And so this has a bearing on the evolution of the nervous system, because this position here, basal, would uh, imply that the nervous system would have been invented twice. And so those are controversies uh, and like depending on the exact method that you're using, uh, you will obtain different trees with a strong statistical support. And this clearly shows that the current models are inadequate or there are still a certain number of things that we have not correctly understood uh, about, uh, about how to model the evolution of coding sequences in order to properly reconstruct the phylogenies. And so basically, uh, if we come back to the argument of uh, long branch traction, the whole question is when you see like here, the same state in two different species, uh, you have to correctly evaluate how likely it is that you share this state because by descent, because it's a shared derived character or because it's a convergent uh, evolutionary event. And so all this uh, is deeply dependent on the probability of convergent evolution, which is itself strongly dependent on uh, like the specificities that you can have at different sites in terms of the probability of accepting the amino acids. So typically, because of biochemical conservation, you will have a very small number of amino acids that will be acceptable at each site. And because of this, like if you have only two amino acids at a given column, then the probability of converging to the same amino acid by chance in two unrelated species is very high. But if your model is not correctly modeling this point, and if it assumes that all 20 amino acids are equally likely at each position, then you will essentially underestimate the probability of convergent evolution. And because of that, you will tend to reconstruct artifactual trees. And so that's the whole point, actually, uh, on which uh, I and other people have tried to focus over the last 10 years in order to correctly account for this uh, aspect of the evolutionary process. And this in order to to obtain more reliable phylogenetic inference. And so the main challenge then is to accommodate 
uh, different amino acid preferences across sites. But this is difficult because first you have to integrate uncertainty about those site-specific amino acid preferences. And then you don't know anything about the distribution of amino acid preferences across sites, uh, which is potentially complex. And so, and then finally, you have to find computationally scalable solutions to this problem. And so the idea here is to use non-parametric modeling in a Bayesian context. So basically, the idea is to try to actually propose uh, a distribution of amino acid profile across sites in terms of a mixture model, but a very rich mixture model that will try to fit the true distribution as closely as possible. And so in the Bayesian context, what you can do is try to find a very fine grain mixture by essentially first uh, make a distribution of weights, an infinite distribution. So technically we use a stick breaking process. So we draw random numbers here, x1, x2, x3. And so we have a unit a length uh, stick that represents the total weight of the mixture and we cut it into parts. And then the remaining part here will be cut again and cut again and cut again. And this gives us an infinite series of weights. And then we also draw an infinite series of amino acid frequency profiles from some base distribution, which is called here G0. And we combine them together. And this gives a random distribution. So each spike here has a certain height that corresponds to the weight. And then uh, each has also a, an associated amino acid frequency profile. And then, then we can imagine that all of the sites of the multiple sequence alignment will draw uh, a frequency profile from this distribution. And this distribution has an infinite number of components. And so of course, we cannot fit this distribution directly to the data because we will overfit. But then in a Bayesian context, you see here, we have a way to draw this distribution randomly, the way I've specified earlier. And so you can see here, uh, we have an unknown true distribution of amino acid preferences across sites. We have this base distribution, which is just uh, like our reference, our first guess, if you wish. And then we have this random draw here, which is close to G0, but like a random deviation from it. And so you can repeat these draws many times, and you will have like a cloud of points here that will essentially create or induce a prior over a distribution space that will be dense over the complete distribution space and that will visit the neighborhood of any arbitrary distribution, including the true distribution. And then this prior, if you combine it with data, with the likelihood, will give you a posterior distribution that will become increasingly concentrated around the true distribution as the data set becomes larger and larger. And so you have asymptotic consistency uh, properties there. So that's the whole idea of of Bayesian non-parametrics uh, using Dirichlet processes. And so in the end, practically what this means, uh, so we end up with an MCMC sampling system where essentially we randomly resample the allocations of all of the sites of the alignment to components of an infinite mixture that are themselves being resampled during MCMC. And all this is resampled along with the tree topology. And so that makes a relatively computationally intensive uh, MCMC device. Uh, and so in the end, this allows the system to accommodate for arbitrary variation in amino acid preferences across sites. So I should say this is a case of uh, unsupervised statistical learning of an arbitrary distribution across sites. But this in the context of uh, a model that otherwise makes relatively uh, specific assumptions, uh, in particular, for instance, the fact that different genes are sharing the same evolutionary history. So I think it's an important point here, like this articulation between uh, unsupervised learning, a very general learning as a module that is uh, introduced within a model that has otherwise relatively strict assumptions in other directions. And so in the end, this kind of model uh, offers a possibility of like uh, estimating arbitrary distributions. So here I've just shown you an example in a case where the data have been simulated under a complex distribution of preferences, uh, amino acid preferences across sites. And so those models have been used uh, relatively often over the, last, uh, over the last 10 years. And in particular, in the case of the animal phylogeny, this is one of the key actually, like if you model those preferences across sites, then you get this different topology compared to what you obtain 
uh, if, you, uh, if you use a classical model. So concerning the position of tinophores. And so this has been a controversy and the controversy is still running in a sense. Uh, recently, there have been uh, some uh, interesting uh, simulation experiments that have been conducted in order to actually uh, try to, to see uh, better, to, to try to find more convincing arguments about, uh, about the possibility that the artifact is actually, uh, that, that it's actually an artifact that you have with the classical models. So the idea basically is to start from empirical data and then to compare what you get with the classical models and those Bayesian non-parametric models are introduced. And so you have those different topologies for the tree, like tinophores are sister group to animals. Here, sponges are sister group to all other animals. And then you re-simulate under those two uh, different uh, hypotheses. And then you reanalyze the simulated data using, again, the classical or the Bayesian non-parametric models. And so it's interesting to see in that case that if you re-simulate under the classical models, then the classical approach recovers this tree T1, and the Bayesian non-parametric approach also recovers this tree. But conversely, if you simulate under the tree that has been obtained by the Bayesian non-parametric approach, and also with site-specific amino acid preferences, in that case, the Bayesian non-parametric approach recovers this tree T2, but the classical approach recovers the tree T1. And so that's a case where we can see here that we are recapitulating basically the whole controversy. We are able to reproduce a situation where we know the truth. And in that case, we also see exactly the same pattern as what we see on the empirical data. So these experiments have been uh, published by uh, Ashalia Kapli and Max Telford last year, two years ago, actually. So this is thus far all about uh, phylogenetics. Now, I mean, uh, this also relies on a certain number of simplifications. Uh, I've told you that uh, we are uh, actually looking directly at the amino acid sequences, but in reality, these are genetic sequences that are nucleotide level sequences. And we have synonymous substitutions and non-synonymous substitutions. So we are actually at the level of the codons. And also uh, each of those substitution events along the tree is actually a population process that starts with a mutation in a single individual a mutation that eventually reaches fixation. And using population genetics first principles, we can actually derive the expected rate of substitution based on the mutation rate and the fitness of the initial and the final amino acids multiplied by the effective population size. And so we can actually derive a Markov process of evolution based on population genetics arguments and using parameters here that so then those parameters, the fitness parameters, they correspond to amino acid preferences, but then you also have mutation rates and you have also potentially uh, population, population level processes here or parameters. And then uh, this gives a more like mechanistic uh, perspective uh, in which you can reframe the entire modeling perspective here. Essentially, those site-specific amino acid preferences, they will now be interpreted as fitness parameters. Then you have mutation rates, but also you have here effective population size, which will be different between different species. And so we will model the differences between lineages using another non-parametric device, which is essentially a Brownian motion along the tree. And so here, you see, we can combine uh, a mechanistic argument together with uh, relatively agnostic uh, systems like the Dirichlet process prior across sites or the Brownian process uh, through time across the lineages. And in the end, this allows us to essentially tease apart uh, the fitness landscape across amino acid positions and variation between species in mutation rates, mutation biases or effective population size or other aspects. Like an example here is a reconstruction of the variation in the long-term effective population sizes along the tree, uh, in the case of placental mammals that we published uh, last year. So in the end, I, I would just like to finish on, on, on these more general ideas. You see, uh, all of what I've shown here is really a situation where we don't have any access to uh, a ground truth, like independent access. So it's fundamentally unsupervised learning. 
it's not the situation where you can easily like train like a model or uh, like a neural network in order to find truth because you don't have any independent uh, database for which to learn on which to learn uh, and so this connects to a problem here that uh, much of current machine learning is actually operational and not directly inferential and i would like to argue that actually uh, probabilistic modeling uh, together with uh, like the general uh, statistical principles provide uh, a globally coherent framework for doing unsupervised and transparent uh, inference statistical inference and so you see machine learning is is interesting but somehow it should find its place within a more uh, like structured uh, conceptual framework where we can still do uh, unsupervised and like uh, uh, to get human insight about the processes that are behind and in this respect i think that uh, probabilistic modeling is interesting because you see because of this uh, hierarchical modeling uh, possibilities that are offered by Bayesian inference, you can articulate together different modules, some of which are making very strict mechanistic assumptions, which will give structure to your model. But then you articulate this with other modules that are um, much more agnostic, like the Dirichlet process, for instance, to learn aspects, complex aspects of the, of the, of the underlying distributions. And so this is somehow a blend between unsupervised machine learning and model-based inference. So as it stands, it has uh, important scalability issues. And so there are uh, several possibilities there. Some people are uh, exploring uh, approximate approaches, such as variational inference. And then also, uh, th there is a current trend where people are trying to use uh, like deep learning or machine learning modules. But th the whole question, I think, now is how to introduce those modules in the context of model-based inference in order to still have those statistical principles that allow you to correctly measure and to correctly uh, evaluate your uncertainty and to correctly evaluate also the goodness of fit of your models. And so with that, I would like to thank all of the people that have contributed uh, to this uh, work. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicola, for a stimulating uh, talk. I have a couple of questions, but I see that Jakob uh, has his hand raised. So, um, Jakob. So, hi, uh, it's, this was a very interesting talk. Um, I wonder, uh, I mean, there are several questions that come to my mind, but perhaps the one that is the most the, the, the phenomenon that is the most troubling when I think about uh, the controversies that you've raised is that, as you've said, if you get more and more data, the distribution, the posterior distribution will almost always concentrate. So we will have more and more confidence from the point of view of the end user that looks at the posterior distribution, we will sort of naively tend to get more and more confident about our results. But as you've mentioned, this if the model is flawed, uh, this confidence is can be entirely misplaced. Right. Uh, and the question in, to me is, can we devise some protocols to kind of check our assumptions in a formalized way uh, as opposed to be, your answer seems to be let's develop better models, but in some sense our models will always be flawed in some way. It's just a matter of more or less flawed. Yes, uh, well there are. I didn't mention that, but uh, I mean perhaps one of the most important aspects of uh, model-based inference is that you have access to a goodness of fit uh, checks, so you can definitely uh, like. Uh, after the fact, basically, if you re-simulate under your estimate and under the model, new data like replicates, you can compare them with the true data. And then, I mean, you can check whether there are differences between them. In fact, you can even train perhaps uh, a neural network to be able to find out the true data set in the midst of all of the replicates that you've made from your model. And that would be like a, a, like adversarial, uh, you see, uh, adversarial, uh, sorry, uh, aspect to it. But because this is an important point right now in terms of goodness of fit, uh, 
I mean, currently, goodness of fit is, uh, is done using summary statistics that we've chosen ourselves. And so we need to find a good summary statistics in order to be able to actually identify where the model is wrong. But then, I mean, there would be a way, perhaps that way, to actually uh, have general uh, goodness of fit, like universal check. Okay, are you happy, Jakob? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, so um, um, like you, uh, Nicola, I'm struggling to um, see, you know, how can we use artificial intelligence and machine learning effectively in statistical phylogenetics? There, there's a fairly recent paper, I think, in Nature Communications by Tal Popko and, and colleagues, where they use uh, maximum likelihood to improve inference eff efficiency. So the, the problem is defined, I guess, and, and mac machine learning is just used to find more effective ways of yeah. doing inference. Is that, do you think that's promising direction? That's one promising direction. That's more like the computational direction, perhaps, mm -hmm. or like your heuristic search problems. There is another very interesting direction, which is actually to, you see, to simulate, I mean, you can, because right now we need to be able to compute the likelihood in order to actually implement Bayesian inference. And even then, I mean, it can be computationally uh, very intensive, uh, but you could simulate, you could de design a model that represents what you believe about uh, the, the true processes that could be potentially very complex, including insertions, deletions and everything, and then simulate a lot under this model and train the network to be able to actually uh, to learn the transfer function between your assumptions and the parameters of the model, the topology of the tree, and the data. So you can learn to uh, do the inverse work, basically. Now I give you data, can you give me the parameters? And so basically, uh, you, you, the, the likelihood is learned by a, a deep, uh, like a, a, uh, like a multi-layer network. And then you can use it to, uh, to, to infer and then potentially also design a goodness of fit uh, test on it. The only problem, and, and some people are doing this right now, they are doing this for phylodynamics. I've seen that uh, from Samuel Alison, and some other people are trying it, I know, with, uh, with phylogenetics. But uh, the, 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 the point now is how to, I mean, you get a point estimate and you don't get like from the neural networks currently, you don't get like a posterior distribution. You don't get a good account of your statistical uncertainty. That's, I guess, one of the of the, of the current problems. But that definitely that would be a way to use a, a like a machine learning or AI module within model-based inference. So would it be correct to describe that as this as sort of describing a super model like as model space, uh, really, where you're using artificial intelligence to navigate that or or learn uh, where you are in that space. Yeah, or actually, uh, you could see it as a like a generalized ABC because uh, it's it's the idea of ABC. But then, I mean, it's a uh, like the, the the whole ABC part is done by the by the neural network. Yeah, I have one uh, final question. If nobody else, um, uh, um, so I mean, it's really difficult to find situations where you have any data in phylogenetics that you can call the, the truth. You can really observe what's happening. But maybe in viruses, phylodynamics type of model, we have time series now that actually have some relevance. You think that could help us? And perhaps even some of those principles we can learn from those systems can be applied also longer time scales. I guess so. I guess so. I, at least I can see, like, if you take uh, HIV data, uh, I mean, you definitely have amino acid preferences across sites. You definitely have positive selection and saturation. And so I guess those are challenging cases. So, yeah, it could be used to actually uh, challenge <laughs> some of the models. Okay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Thank you. Nicola, uh, um, for uh, giving this uh, stimulating talk. Uh,